in the name of Jesus, amen. The beginning for them was a 4th of July carnival in Rolla, Missouri in 1937. Mutual friends had arranged for them to meet. That's the way they did it in the days before eHarmony and Christian Mingle and dot, Match.com. I'm not sure it was love at first sight, but there was definitely an attraction. And they started writing letters carried by the mail train from Rolla to Webster Groves near St. Louis. Once or twice a week, for nearly a year, they wrote about their daily lives, their friends and family, their dreams and hopes, and their growing love for one another. Years later, when she was well into her 90s, my mother discovered those letters, saved in a shoebox, far on a back shelf in the closet in the bedroom. My father had died years before. For me and my siblings, that box of letters was a great gift, helping us to know our parents in ways that we never had before. But for my mother, especially when dementia began to play tricks on her mind and her memory, those letters were real gifts. She could remember again details of her life as a housekeeper and nanny, the people she worked for, the friends she had, the things she did. But mostly she could remember how much she was loved and she felt cherished again. Our readings for this morning are a little like those love letters, reminding us how beloved we are, how cherished we are, reminding us that it is no accident that we are here. It's no second thought. Rather, it was the intention in God's heart from the beginning. That passage from John would have reminded the first readers then and reminds us now of another passage that starts in the beginning, a story that recounts the overflowing of God's love in an abundant creation of sun and moon, of sea and dry land, of plants and animals, and of human people, flesh and blood, male and female. As, wonder, as wonderful as love letters are, though, there's nothing quite like being in the physical presence of the beloved. My parents' letters gave testimony to that, and maybe you know it from your own experience, too. And so, the Word became flesh. The word that was from the beginning, the word that was with God, the word that was God, the word that brought about the whole creation, that word became flesh. The one who was eternal entered into time. The one who was divine became human. The one who was create, creator became creature. The Word became flesh with all that that implies. To be flesh is to be transitory here today and gone tomorrow. To be flesh is in many ways to have so little control over our lives and our world. To be flesh is to be vulnerable. 
my friend Anne, when she was just a toddler years ago, pulled on her mother's sleeve one Christmas Eve and whispered, kind of giggling, I have something serious and something silly to tell you. The serious thing is, God holds the whole world in his hands. The silly thing is, at Christmas, we can hold God in our hands. Think about it. The God of all creation, the eternal word made flesh, held in frail human hands nursed at Mary's breast, burped on her shoulder, having to learn to talk and walk, being toilet trained, playing under Joseph's carpentry bench, studying the Torah, making friends, living in a world amidst fear of oppressors who treated people as less than human, seeing human beings suffer and die at one another's hands, walking dusty roads, teaching disciples who don't seem to get it, reaching out to all sorts of people, loving especially the fringy ones, experiencing rejection, longing for and bringing wholeness and oneness for all, finally being handed over to death on a cross and feeling that real heart of flesh stop beating. In the end, vulnerable, transitory, helpless. This is the way the word became flesh. This is the real world in which the word made flesh took up a dwelling place. And somehow, in all of this, God's glory is revealed. In all of this, God's grace and truth is made evident. In all of this, we get a glimpse into God's own heart. It's a mystery that we cannot fathom. It's love that we can scarcely imagine. It's something our words cannot contain. It's the stuff poetry is made of, hymns, love songs, like the ones the early Christians sang, the one the writer of the Gospel of John excerpted in today's reading, a love song like our reading from Ephesians, a love song like that hymn that began our service today. The last part of the story, the part that begins in chapter 20 of the Gospel of John, might also have started in the beginning, but the Gospel writer chose instead early on the first day of the week while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. The ending of the love story, the love letter, is also a beginning of a story. Now clearly not just a story about Jesus, the word become flesh, but also a story about disciples, now become children of God. It's a story about the us among whom the word made flesh lived. It's a story about the we who have seen God's glory in this one full of grace and truth. It's a story about the we who have all received grace upon grace. It's a story about the we who have seen the risen Christ. It's a story about the you Jesus sent into the world the way Jesus was sent from the beginning. Saint Athanasius, one of the great teachers of the church in Alexandria, Egypt, in the fourth century, wrote, 
in Jesus Christ, God became what we are in order that we become what God is. In baptism, we are clothed with Christ whose story becomes our story. Our old false self is put to death and a new creation in the risen Christ arises. Even in the midst of this real world, we live the reality of the eternal word. That word, once enfleshed in Jesus Christ, is now alive in the real flesh and blood of the community of faith, the body of Christ living now in this world that God so much loves. We know this world only too well. It's a world of drive-by shootings, of oppressive dictators, of racial discord and bigotry, of police assassinations, of dysfunctional politics, of child abuse, of addictions, of refugees and displaced persons, of terrorists, of people dying from hunger and thirst, of water polluted and land depleted by care carelessness or abuse, of, of the list goes on. This is the world we have messed up, and this is the real world which God so much loves. The mission that we share in this world as bearers of the risen Christ, as wearers of the risen Christ. Our mission is to share, to bear God's creative, redeeming word. To be God's creative, redeeming word. It's not an individual task. It's our mission together. I wonder, how will we be word in this world? What kind of letter is the world receiving from the ELCA this week? What word does the world receive from us? And our congregations and faith communities back home, what kind of letter do our neighbors read in us? We might ponder this. Where will we put our bodies in this world to be word made flesh? What streets, dusty or not, will we walk? With what fringy people will we rub shoulders? What disciples will disappoint us? To whom will we reach out? Where will we take a stand? to express our longing for God's wholeness and oneness for all? What deaths will we face? And as we ponder these things, we may well find ourselves asking another question. How on earth will we find the courage and the stamina to be God's enfleshed word in this world. Our reading from John ends, no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made God known. When we, who were to be preachers at this assembly, studied this text together, Bishop Eaton, related her memory of being a little girl and crawling on her mother's lap on Sunday afternoon while her mother read the paper. She recounted leaning in to her mother's bosom where she could hear her mother's heartbeat. The word made flesh invites us into that kind of intimacy with God. We are invited to lean in to come close, to hear and feel God's own heartbeat. 
We come close. We lean in when we read the love letters again and again, when we hear the love stories told and retold from the beginning until today of people loved and loving. We lean in and come close when we gather with a community of faith, with flesh and blood people we can touch and see and hear and hug, people in whom the eternal word is alive and well. We lean in and come close when we are sprinkled with water or remember our baptism in other ways, living from and returning to that holy font to claim our inheritance already now as children of God. We lean in and come close when we take into our frail hands and into our own flesh the word made flesh, baked into bread and fermented into wine. We lean in and come close when we see the face of Christ in the neighbor we seek to serve. I'm told there's a principle in physics called attunement. It was described to me this way. If two pendula are swinging in different ways and are brought close together, they will become attuned and begin to swing in unison. Or two electrical currents running along, if they're brought close together, will soon be moving on the same wavelength. When we come together, lean in and come close to God's heart, God transforms us. And by God's grace, we will, even if just a little bit, every once in a while, find our heart beating in the same rhythm as God's own. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>